In this lecture, we're going to talk about coordinate systems. So in the previous lecture, we talked about the idea of a basis. So when we have a subspace of Rn, remember that's a subset of Rn that contains the zero vector, is closed under vector addition, and closed under scalar multiplication. And if that set of vectors is linearly independent and spans the subspace, we say that those vectors form a basis. So it's kind of a complicated definition, but we went through some examples. So if you need a review, go ahead and watch that lecture again. But why do we care? Why do we want a basis for a subspace? Well, one of the primary reasons is that if we have a vector in that subspace, it turns out that we can write that vector as a linear combination of the basis vectors in exactly one way. There's only one way to do it. And that uniqueness turns out to be very useful. Okay, so why is that uniqueness true? Well, let's suppose that we had that same vector, so it's the same x in both cases, written as a linear combination of the basis vectors in two different ways. But what we would be able to do is subtract these equations from one another. So if I take this first equation and subtract the second equation, so I'm gonna subtract x on the left and d1, b1, plus, 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 all the way up through dp, bp on the right. If I subtract those, well, on the left-hand side, I just get the zero vector. On the right-hand side, what I get is C1B1 minus D1B1, and then I get plus C2B2 minus D2B2 plus, and so on. So I get these sort of pairs of differences all the way up through CPBP minus DPBP. But now what I can do is use my algebraic properties and basically factor out the B1. So I get C1 minus D1 times B1 plus C2 minus D2 times B2 all the way up through CP minus DP times BP. So what do we have here? What we have is a linear combination of the B vectors that's equal to the zero vector. But one of the things we know about a basis is that the vectors are linearly independent. And when vectors are linearly independent, the only linear combination that can equal the zero vector is when all of the scalars equal zero. So this scalar has to equal zero. This scalar has to equal zero. All the way up through this scalar has to equal zero. But that means that C1 has to equal D1, and C2 has to equal D2, and all the way up through CP has to equal DP, which means that these two different looking linear combinations are actually not different at all. They're the exact same linear combination. So that's the usefulness of a basis. The basis tells us that we have this one and only one way to write a vector in the subspace as a linear combination of the basis vectors. So the name that we have for that one way to do it is coordinates. So we say that the scalars in that linear combination, so this C1, C2, C3, and so on, all the way up through CP, if we put those coordinates into a vector, we call that vector the coordinates of the vector x relative to the basis b. And the notation we use here is we put x in brackets and we put a subscript and then the name of the basis. We'll very often use a script b for the basis, but if we have multiple bases, we might call them b1, b2, or we might use c or d or something like that. But b stands for basis, so that's a typical notation that we'll use. So let's do an example. So here we have two vectors, v1 and v2, and let's let b, the set script b, be the set of v1 and v2. So what we have here is B is a basis for the span of V1 and V2. So the space that we're talking about is the span of those two vectors. Remember, when we have only two vectors, it's pretty easy to tell when the vectors are linearly independent because all we need to look at is whether one of them is a scalar multiple of the other. Since we can look at V1 and V2 here and tell that neither is a scalar multiple of the other, we can tell that the, base, the vectors are linearly independent and they span, obviously, the subspace. So this is a basis, and what we want to know is to find the coordinates of this new vector x relative to b. Note, by the way, that it's not obvious that x is even in, is in the span of v1 and v2. Right? That's not obvious at all just from looking at it. It turns out that it's true, but that's not obvious just from glancing at it. All right, so how do we do this? Well, what we want are uh, coordinates, scalars, C1 and C2, so that X looks like C1V1 plus C2V2. There should be one and only one way to do this. 
But that means that we're solving a vector equation, right? The vector equation that we're trying to solve is c1 times the first vector, 1, negative 2, 3, plus c2 times the second vector, negative 1, 0, negative 4, equaling my vector x, 5, negative 4, 18. And we know how to solve that kind of vector equation. We were going to set up and row reduce an augmented matrix. So that matrix looks like this. We've got 1, negative 1, 5 in the first row, negative 2, 0, negative 4 in the third, uh, second row, and the third row, 3, negative 4, 18. I use some technology to row reduce that. I get 1, 0, 2, 0, 1, negative 3, 0, 0, 0. And so my solution is that C1 equals 2 and C2 equals negative 3. So my coordinates, x in basis b, are 2, negative 3. I got two scalars. So even though x is in R3, the coordinates of x, there are two of them because my basis has two vectors. So in my coordinate vector, I have one value, one entry for each vector in my basis. So just to recap that previous example, if we call H that subspace that we talked about, the span of V1 and V2, that's a subspace of R3. But because it has two basis vectors, it looks like R2. It's a plane in R3. So and that plane can be thought of as a rotated version of R2, the XY plane that lives inside of R3. So the coordinates allow us to make that comparison more directly, right? We can tell how that vector X is constructed from that basis. In what way does x relate to those two basis vectors? So even though x is a vector in R3, the coordinates of x are a vector in R2. So this connection between the actual vectors in my space and the coordinate vectors, that turns out that that's a linear transformation that is one-to-one -one and onto. And those are very important kinds of linear transformations when we study algebra. That kind of transformation is called an isomorphism. We're not going to go deeper into the study of that in this course, but it's a very important concept going forward into the study of linear algebra and then also abstract algebra. Okay, getting back to examples, let's do another one here. So here we have three vectors, again in R3. We want to first prove that B, which is the set of U1, U2, and U3, we want to prove that that's a basis for R3. This is actually kind of a review problem from the previous lecture, but let's just go through it. Remember, to be a basis, B must be 1, linearly independent, so those three vectors have to be linearly independent, and two, they have to span all of R3. Well, we can figure that out. We can solve both of those pieces all at once simply by row reducing the matrix that has these vectors as its columns. So this matrix, here's my first vector, here's my second vector, here's my third vector, if I row reduce that matrix, I just get the identity matrix. So what does that tell us? Well, by the invertible matrix theorem, we know that that means that these columns do exactly what we need. They are linearly independent and they span all of R3. So that's a pretty easy way to do that from just the what we've already learned from the uh, invertible matrix theorem. Okay, so now for question two, if we want to compute the coordinates of x in the basis B, remember what we're looking for are scalars C1, C2, and C3, such that C1 U1 plus C2 U2 plus C3 U3 equals x. We want to solve that equation. Well, the augmented matrix for that equation looks like the matrix we just had, the matrix whose columns are those u vectors, and then the augmented column is the vector x, negative 4, negative 2, 1. And so we want to reduce that. And when we do, we get this. So as expected, the first three columns look like the identity matrix. And then we get 7 over 38. We get negative 3 over 19. And then we get 49 over 38. And so that tells us that my solution, my coordinate vector, x in basis b, is those three numbers. 7 over 38, negative 3 over 19, and 49 over 38. That's my solution to this problem. All right, let's do one more. So here we have three vectors, w1, w2, and w3. We want to prove that b is linearly independent. This is going to be enough to show that b is a basis for the span of those three vectors. So if I let h be the span of w1, w2, and w3, that's my subscripts there, 
W2 and W3, then B is a basis for H if we have those two criteria. Remember, the two criteria are that B has to be linearly independent, and then B has to span H. But B spans H by definition, right? B is this set, this set of three vectors, that is B. So B spanning H, we get that automatically. Whether these vectors are linearly independent, that we don't know automatically. So what we do is we set up a matrix that has these W vectors as its columns. Four, one, zero, negative one, negative two, negative two, one, zero, and we row reduce. Again, I'm using some technology here to save myself the trouble. But when I do that, I get this matrix. When we look at that matrix, we see that that matrix has a pivot in every column. And by the linearly independent columns theorem, that tells us that the columns are linearly independent. That's why we call that theorem that. So that get, tells us that these vectors are linearly independent. And so this is a basis. So even though the question said prove that these vectors are linearly independent, we need to look at that and understand that what we're really doing is showing that this set B is a basis for the set that those vectors span. And now that we have a basis, we can find coordinates. So again, we have a vector X. It's not obvious that X is in H, but that's okay. That'll play out when we go through this. So when we set up our matrix, again, the matrix is gonna look pretty similar to what we just did. with that augmented column being this vector x, negative four, two, two. And when we reduce that, we get one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero, and three halves, negative one half, one, zero. So that tells me that my first variable is three halves, my second variable is negative one half, and my third variable is one. So that means that my coordinates are those three numbers, three over two, negative one over two, and one. Now, if we had re reduced this matrix, and if we had had a pivot in the last column, that would have meant that this equation had no solution, which would have told us that the vector that we started with wasn't actually in our subspace. So when you do this, when you're looking for coordinates, you should get exactly one answer. There should be no free variables, and there should be no pivot in the last column. There should be exactly one solution and that's by that theorem that we proved earlier in this lecture.